Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Forza Sanity Preserver. This is the daily uh, online salon in which we try to make sense of COVID-19 and in which we feature uh, projects uh, uh, that are trying to uh, seek solutions uh, to uh, COVID-19. Um, I'm super thrilled today to have Dr. Daniel Tillett here. Uh, Daniel is um, a founder and CEO of Nucleix, which is an Australian biotechnology company that's focused on the development of software tools that improve DNA sequencing um, and genomics. He's here not primarily to talk about this, but to talk about a proposal that at least tangentially um, um, uh, relies on uh, relies on that software, but basically uh, on, on his personal website, he has recently published a few articles uh, that have crossed quite the stir on Hacker News uh, and uh, that, that are really, I think, quite a fantastic um, kind of like example of how uh, kind of like folks uh, can do uh, really citizen science, citizen science uh, and, and collaborate in and trying to find potentially other solutions than uh, the current uh, vaccines that many biotech companies are working on. Um, he'll be talking a little bit more about the idea and I'll be posting the uh, articles both in the chat notes uh, so you can look them up on the sanity schedule on foresight.org. Um, and, um, you know, really in a nutshell, he will be speaking on the search for an attenuated uh, natural strain um, of COVID-19, uh, which could um, um, potentially serve as a solution. Um, the idea is that basically there have been uh, found a few strains that are less pathogenic than most strains that are infecting people that we currently uh, kind of like focus on servicing. And uh, if we could find those, uh, you know, they could you know, potentially um, be, be used to produce a vaccine uh, or they could also just be used uh, by folks um, perhaps uh, um, self-infecting themselves with those strains, even though that is obviously more risky um, and uh, and getting away with a much, much milder version of, of COVID-19. Also, those strains seem to be out competing uh, the, the more deadly strains naturally so. So, uh, you know, the, the more, the, the, the better we can, the, the quicker we can find those and uh, make them more prevalent, uh, the faster we can um, kind of like almost naturally out-compete the, out -compete the worst range strains. Um, okay, I'll be posting a few links uh, that are relating to this here in the in the show notes. But uh, for now, uh, I want to give the stage uh, to Daniel. I'm super, super happy uh, to have you here. And I will be finishing off with a few action items that uh, people can take if they want to help this project along, because uh, currently it's in, in the idea stage and really anyone uh, could help with this. All right. I'm super, super happy. Uh, Daniel, the stage is yours. Okay. So, this is a proposal that um, it occurred to me about two weeks ago now, um, and it was kind of a little bit unusual where you just you have an idea, and then everything flows from that once you have that idea. So, I wish I'd had this idea a little bit earlier, um, so we were a bit further advanced. But so far, it's actually uh, picked up quite a bit of interest and run. Uh, it managed to make it onto the first page of Hacker News uh, and generated a lot of discussion. Uh, so really it's a new way of searching for a vaccine strain and making use of effectively evolution and some of the new tools we have available uh, through genomics and epidemiology to isolate a strain that will behave as though it was a naturally attenuated vaccine-like strain. So let's see if we go forward. So I, I'm sure everyone here knows all the problems about COVID-19 and what makes it so diabolical is it sits in a death rate which is too high to ignore but too low to uh, send the world into a kind of a panic mode to actually do something about it. So it's, you have countries like Sweden, arguably the US, which is kind of sitting on the middle. Do we do something? Do we just let it run? And the reason this is such a problem is that unless we get on top of it worldwide, we're going to have very little ability to control this. And if I move on to the next slide, the reason why this is such a problem is things like drug treatments, which are coming. Now, there's a lot of work going on at the moment. In fact, probably too much work going on developing new drug treatments. But the problem with all the drug treatments is vulnerable people, um, and that includes uh, poor people. But vulnerable people, you can go from having, if you're, say, in a nursing home, you can go from being 
totally fine, maybe just feeling a little ill, to dead within a couple of hours, in which case no drug treatment is going to help under those sort of circumstances. Second problem is because there is so much uh, behaviour that people are hiding themselves away uh, from getting this virus, it's going to take a long time for herd immunity to develop and it may never develop. And the reason why is the coronaviruses as a class, the immunity to those does not last very long. On average, for a common cold one, it's 40 weeks uh, you have immunity after you're an infection. So you can be infected time and time and time again with one of these strains. And we could face exactly the same thing with um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and then the second problem with, or the third problem with drug treatments is the high cost. None of these treatments are going to be cheap. So if you're in the Congo or, you know, parts of the world which are very poor, there's no way you're going to be able to afford to uh, have some uh, treatment. Basically, you can't even get treated for something as cheap as malaria in a lot of these places. So how are you going to take some drug which costs tens of thousands of dollars? Consequence of all of this is if we don't get on top of it, uh, and it looks like that it's not going to be possible to do by uh, isolation. We're going to have yearly and sporadic outbreaks all the time. As soon as you have any large crowd occurring, you go to a sporting event, a concert, anything like this, this is going to be classic outbreak environment, church, uh, and you'll get these occurring as immunity wanes in the, uh, in the population, you'll get a new outbreak. The final reason why we need a vaccine is a risk of something being more deadly arising. And if we look back to the influenza pandemic in 1918, 1919, the first wave of that pandemic was relatively mild. And it wasn't until uh, later in the year that there was an outbreak of a deadly strain of influenza. And there's, while there's a general trend for viruses to become less pathogenic over time, there's no guarantee of that. Um, and sometimes some viruses can actually become more pathogenic and more dangerous over time. And when that occurs, uh, we could suddenly go from something that's maybe killing half a percent to 1% of the population to something that's killing 10% of the population. And I, um, I, that's not an outcome that I think we should be allowing to even take a risk of occurring. So the question becomes, you know, how long are we going to have a vaccine? And the answer to that is it's a very complicated question. If you talk to the people who actually are trying to develop vaccines, a lot of them are quite pessimistic. Um, and the reason why is we haven't become very good in society at developing new vaccines. It takes an enormous amount of time, uh, five to seven years, if you're lucky, um, to get a vaccine. For example, for SARS-CoV-1, we still don't have a vaccine, even though that was nearly 20 years ago. Uh, some of that's due to a lack of interest, but there has been work progressing on that in the background over the last 10 years, uh, and we still don't have a vaccine. And the reason why is basically the regulatory hurdles these days are so huge and the safety demands are so high that it's very difficult to find a vaccine that's both effective and without any risk. And of course, find the money to do all the testing required. So if you look at the sort of the phases you have to do animal uh, testing, which is not easy, then you've got to go through phase one, phase two, phase three, wait, test large numbers of people, watch them for long periods of time. Then you get the problem of production and scaling. And that's a huge problem with a lot of the uh, proposals. The RNA type uh, vaccine proposals are going to have a great deal of trouble scaling up to anything. And particularly with SARS, uh, the group of uh, coronaviruses is this problem called antibody dependent enhancement. Uh, I've called it the joker in the pack. Um, and it's a problem which is where the vaccine actually makes the disease worse. It makes it more deadly. And this has been seen quite frequently in the animal model vaccines that were developed for SARS-CoV-1. And there's no particular reason to think that we wouldn't see the same type of problem with SARS-CoV-2. They're very similar uh, viruses overall. Uh, it's something in about uh, quite a few respiratory viruses, RSV is another one that has the same problem. And as a consequence of all of this, this makes the regulatory agents extremely cautious uh, with proceeding with a vaccine because 
you're taking the risk that you actually may be harming people. And so it becomes very hard for the FDA to give approval to use a, a vaccine candidate widely if there's the risk that you'll end up killing large numbers of people. So the process of this means that each stage moves at a glacial pace. Uh, the best case is kind of like 18 months, um, but it may be that it could well be in the never, never. Uh, it may well be other solutions may be found before we ever get to a vaccine. All of this suggests that given the high cost there is of allowing this um, pandemic to continue, that we should try as many different approaches as possible. I don't think we should end any vaccine uh, development that has the possibility of working because we really don't know at this stage what will work or what won't work. So this brings us to my proposal, um, uh, which by the way, um, I've since found out that another group in Europe, um, in France and Italy has basically had come up with exactly the same hypothesis. It's identical when I go down the list of their paper that they're trying to get published at the moment, uh, it's basically uh, word for word identical. I could have written exactly the same scientific paper as they've written. And it's really based around a really simple hypothesis, which is there are natural strains of SARS-CoV-2 out in the world that have mutated to be non-pathogenic. And these ones will all be asymptomatic or mild, which, which are still infective and will provide immunity to the more pathogenic deadly strains. Um, that's a hypothesis. Is this true? Well, we'll have to look at the evidence and we'll come to that in a minute. But it's a fairly simple hypothesis. If there's such a strain out there, um, then that could be used as a live vaccine. And live vaccines uh, are very useful in virology. Um, and the majority of viral vaccines are live vaccines. And this hypothesis also allows us to show that this vaccine strain is safe by using epidemiology. So we track its natural transmission. And from that, we can actually work out if, uh, if the virus is attenuated, is safe, uh, by doing the type of experiments that you can't actually do um, from an ethics, ethical point of view. You can rely on nature to do those experiments. I've called this the search for an attenuated natural strain by epidemiology or the SANE approach, um, mainly because I like acronyms. Um, the question becomes, has this approach ever been done before? And the answer is yes and no. Almost all viral vaccines are live attenuated vaccines. Uh, there are a few that have, say for example, hepatitis B uh, is an example of, that's not a live attenuated, but most of the classical uh, uh, viral diseases things like yellow fever, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, all of those are live attenuated vaccines. And the reason why is live attenuated vaccines work really well. They create exactly the type of immune response that you want. Um, and they're cheap to produce overall. Uh, and, you know, they, they can be sort of, they're sort of old technology. It's been around for a long time, since the 1950s. The process at which these have gone about is you find an isolate, you then what's called passage it, which is grow the strain in cell culture. Uh, you keep passing it from cell culture to cell culture and you wait for mutants to appear that are better adapted to growing in cell culture than they are in a, in a human. Uh, once you have those type of mutants, those mutants you can then put back into a human and they won't grow very well in a human. So it'll cause a mild version or no version of the disease, uh, but they grow quite well in, in cell culture. Uh, they're all created in the lab. And the reason why is I'll talk about this more in the part uh, as I go forward, but it basically comes down to, it's very difficult to find such a strain in nature until very recently. It just wasn't really possible to go out and look for the very rare natural mutants that are attenuated uh, unless you have some particular uh, technology to do so. And the technology to search for a natural attenuated uh, viral strain is been uh, lacking until in the last 10 years. The one exception to this is the Sabin oral polio vaccine. Uh, it had, contains three strains of that vaccine uh, and strain two 
is a natural isolate that was uh, isolated from a child with mild illness. It wasn't uh, grown up in the lab. Uh, this is something that um, Saban, or probably one of Saban's minions, uh, discovered and uh, developed at the lab, and it happened to turn out well. That was just a lucky find. It'd be very difficult to actually look for a natural attenuated polio strain in the 1950s uh, when Saban was out looking for this, but uh, he just happened to get lucky along the way. And the reason why it hasn't been possible is you're really looking for a very rare uh, strain out there that's hiding in amongst all the non-attenuated strains. And to do that, you need to have some rapid technology that can rapidly screen through large numbers of viral strains and tell you straight away, do you have an attenuated strain that's going to be useful? And until the development of modern high throughput genomics and the technology, it was not possible to do that. So otherwise, you'd have to be taking each strain, doing lots and lots of tests in animals. And then you can imagine trying to do that for hundreds of thousands of strains to try and find a naturally attenuated strain. Trend. So rather than do that, they uh, use just use cell culture instead. The question is, well, before we begin, is there any indication that there are naturally attenuated SARS-CoV-2 uh, strains out there? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, there was a strain found in China. It's published in a preprint, which I've got there on the right-hand side. Uh, and this was less pathogenic than the wild type strain. It has a mutation. If you're in cleavage site, um, it's, uh, it's less pathogenic. It's, ideally, if you had a choice between getting the wild type strain or this strain, you'd choose this strain, but it's still too dangerous to use as a vaccine. It'll still make you very ill and it'll still kill a lot of people if it was used. But it does give an example that there is viral diversity out there. And this is nothing unusual. Every single virus that's floating around the real world has uh, strains that are more dangerous, it has strains that are less dangerous, and it's just the nature of the way evolution works. And then, of course, it's no good just saying, oh, okay, we've got one, can we find more? And the answer to that is almost certainly yes. Uh, but we have to go about searching in an efficient way that can make use of the technology and the knowledge we have today. And the key really to this is to search using genomic sequencing. And another example of this is another preprint that came out of Singapore, uh, where they used uh, genome sequencing of the strains that they were picking up in Singapore. And this is from back in March. And they found a strain there that had a large deletion in the genome in a, um, what's called the ORF8. It's a, a secondary uh, regulatory region. Uh, it's not part of the primary uh, structural protein uh, of the virus. Uh, but that says that this is the type of mutation that we're looking for, and this is very easy to discover using genomics. You can search through hundreds of thousands of individual viral strains till you find the right mutation. And the right mutation is one that contains a deletion in the right regions. Uh, we don't know at this stage necessarily which ones are going to be the best, but nature will tell us that question. But you want to know that you've got a, a deletion present and not just a single point mutation or something that might uh, revert back to being uh, dangerous. And I've likened this to looking for a needle in a haystack, but genomics effectively acts as a very large magnet. It's not very difficult to find a needle, assuming it's made out of steel, of course, um, in a haystack if you had a massive electromagnetic uh, thing to pick it up and just quick sweep it over this haystack, the needle will jump up straight onto the, onto the magnet and you found it. What you don't want to be doing is looking through every single uh, uh, fragment, every straw fragment by hand, one at a time looking for that needle. So we can use genomics effectively as a large magnet. The other thing that this provides us with is the natural spread of this strain that we might find can actually act effectively what is a human phase three trial performed by nature. And the huge advantage this gives us is you could not take a lab, I could go into the laboratory tomorrow, I could create an attenuated strain by uh, chopping out various sections. I could probably test it on ferrets uh, or mice. 
Um, but what I wouldn't be able to do is go around and give this to a couple of thousand people to see whether it's safe or not. No regulatory agency is going to allow you or ethics committee is going to allow you to run an experiment like that. However, nature doesn't go to IRBs and ask permission before it performs uh, the experiments it does. It just goes out and does this. So if we find a strain that's attenuated, doesn't cause serious illness, but it's still able to spread, then if you start to search in that local area around the index case, you can look for uh, more people who are infected with that strain. And then you can check to see what the outcome uh, clinically was. If they all had mild illness, none of them ended up in hospital. This epidemiological data will tell you that the strain is um, safe to use. And the high morbidity of um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, allows you to, even with a relatively limited number of people, uh, get a pretty good idea of how it's going to perform more widely. You can also take those same people, check their serology, make sure that they've formed the appropriate immune response that you want, that it cross reacts and provides neutralization against the wild type dangerous strains, which it should because all the structural genes will be identical to the wild type. It'll only be the secondary um, pathogenicity uh, type genes that will be changed. And so you can ensure that this strain will actually perform work quite well. And you can imagine how much this will speed up the process of identifying a vaccine and getting it out and actually used um, in the real world. And so this provides an accelerated path to a vaccine. We can use what nature's done to jump over all the early stage. We don't have to do animal trials. We don't have to do phase one. We don't have to do phase two because we're starting at phase, what's effectively phase three. Uh, as you can imagine, this will slice an enormous amount of development time off for a vaccine. Uh, and a vaccine that's available 12 months sooner than any other, even if it's um, difficult or hard to develop, is going to be extremely valuable. Uh, I think everyone's aware of the economic cost of uh, you know, remaining in lockdown uh, or the disruption to the economy over this time. Um, this is you know, something that the sooner we can get to a vaccine, the better. The other thing is it uses a very well-proven approach to vaccine success. Live attenuated viral vaccines are the way, if you want to make an effective vaccine, this is the way that's most likely to work. Um, it's, it's not necessarily easy to balance the attenuation versus the immunogenicity of a, vac uh, of a live strain. But if you can find one that actually has the right properties, then you'll actually have something you've got a pretty good chance of actually working. There's a whole bunch of other benefits to this as well. Uh, you'll have a vaccine that's simple to produce and administer. Uh, the polio vaccine, for example, is very easy to administer. You don't have to actually inject anyone. You could actually uh, just basically uh, drop either into their mouth or up the nose of the, of the person, uh, and that will provide a live, uh, and that will work that way. So that's much easier to actually go out into places that are hard to actually administer a vaccine to, uh, to people. And people are much more likely to take something that involves basically a drop of liquid on the tongue than they are to have a needle stuck in their uh, arm or thigh. The other thing that this provides is natural spread. Because the virus has been selected from ones that actually have been able to spread naturally in, in the environment, because otherwise you don't get the epidemiological data, it can't spread, you actually, uh, create an environment where people who are vaccinated will spread it to those people around them. Uh, and so you get spread from non-vaccinated to non-vaccinated individuals, which increases the herd immunity. And you also maintain the herd immunity over time. Remember with coronavirus, you have short uh, immunity times. The continued spread of this natural strain around will maintain everyone's immunity to it. Of course, can I, can I interrupt with a question? Sure. Is now that correct me if I'm wrong, but that's quite non standard for a quote unquote yeah, vaccine. Say who you are. Say who you are. I think Danny doesn't know you yet. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm uh, Creon. I'm a, I come to a lot of these seminars and I've spoken at a few, and I know just enough molecular biology to uh, get my stick my foot in it, if you know what I mean, and yep. get all dirty. Um, so yes. 
It, but anyway, the hard questions will come later. But this thing you just described, isn't that very non-standard for a quote-unquote vaccine? It certainly is, although it is and it isn't. Uh, for example, the polio vaccine actually does have a reasonable amount of transmission to non-vaccinated people. And in fact, it's thought to be the way that uh, immunity in adults is maintained. So the constant immunization of children with uh, the live polio vaccine, they then transmit that to adults um, and that goes on. Of course, one of the strains in the polio vaccine has a habit of reverting. It doesn't; have, it only has two mutations, point mutations, to revert back to the wild type. So you do get uh, problems with uh, the wild type. So yes, this is the radical part of this approach. The idea of looking for uh, uh, a live attenuated natural strain is not particularly radical, but the idea of having a vaccine that is transmitted between individuals that aren't vaccinated is very radical. Um, so, but that, this is something that uh, people will need to make a decision of later down the track. I'll talk a bit about this later when I get to that. The other thing this creates is this natural spread is it sets up an ecological battle between the different strains. Um, so what happens is strains compete with one another for those strains that are better at being transmitted tend to take over the world and those that aren't as well transmitted tend to uh, die down. Uh, pathogenicity plays a relatively some role in that. Obviously, if you kill, if you're like a bowler and you kill uh, your host very quickly, uh, that it's hard to transmit. Uh, where something that's pretty asymptomatic, Australian, will tend to be transmitted, all things being equal, uh, better than those because people won't even know they have the virus and they'll be out and about spreading it around. What we can do is we can tip the balance by uh, effectively inoculating large numbers of people with this mild strain to tip the balance to drive the dangerous strains to extinction. In the long term, that's actually very advantageous because it means we can then stop vaccinating. Uh, we can drive uh, much the same way as what we did with smallpox, where we were able to drive smallpox to extinction by using effectively a mild strain, although in this case it was um, a different virus, but one that had um, similarity in, in immunoprotection. Um, if you decide that you don't want to go down this route at all, uh, you think this is too radical to do, such a strain is ideal as a challenge strain for other vaccine approaches. Let's say you, want, you think that your DNA vaccine is the way to go, um, and you want to try and speed up the development of that strain the way to speed up development is to challenge healthy individuals, um, ideally young, um, with the strain and see whether it provides protection. But you don't want to do that with a dangerous strain because you're putting at risk those people. So if you can actually find a naturally attenuated strain that has a much lower risk to the person getting challenged, uh, that's ideally what you want to do. So even if at the end of this uh, process, the decisions made by the regulatory and the political uh, decision makers that they don't want to use the strain, uh, just being able to use it in challenge uh, opportunities will speed up the development of other vaccines. Uh, so it becomes ideal, an ideal strain to use as a challenge. So the best way to do this is all very nice and theoretical, uh, but a lot of the time, and certainly me personally, I like to see spelled out in precise detail all the steps that are required to put something into practice. It helps me understand um, how the concept works, what the limitations are, where the hard parts are, where the simple parts are. And so I put together basically what is a seven step process. I, I kind of cheated, it's actually an eight step process, but one of the steps is in parallel. So I've called it a seven step process. So what would the search for one of these naturally life uh, attenuated strains involve? Well, the first one is we have to collect a lot of samples. Unfortunately, the samples that are currently being collected have, are all generally from people who have severe illness. What you want to collect from is you want to collect from people who have very mild illness or no symptoms at all. That's the type of strain we want. If you go and look for people, strains that have put people into hospital, that's not going to be a very good strain to use for a vaccine. So unfortunately, most of the strains, on top of that, most of the strains, there's no metadata about how attached to the sample that's come into a, a testing laboratory about how severe the illness of, of the person actually is who's being tested. 
uh, as far as the doctor sent the sample off, taken the sample, sent it, and then they don't tell the testing laboratory uh, whether this was a mild case or whether it was a, a serious case. Uh, so this, the simplest way around this whole problem is just to set up a website similar to what SCAN has done. This is in Washington State. Basically, you register on that site if you're in the local Washington State area. They send you a test kit that you can uh, do at home. Uh, you stick the swab up your nose. Um, you put it back in, post it back to them. They'll then test it and tell you whether you're infected or not infected. They're doing this to try and track the spread of coronavirus. Uh, but that same approach, if you focus on mild cases and you use a pooling strategy for testing, you can test a large number of swab samples relatively cheaply and effect, uh, efficiently. Uh, they're continuously overwhelmed with requests. There's a great deal of interest in the community to, um, to know whether they're infected. And certainly from my perspective, I think there'd be a lot of interest in people to participate in this. If you think you've got COVID-19, uh, COVID you think you've got a mild case um, and all your family's got a mild case, they're the sorts of people we want to be testing for. So it's like that, Stan all, we're like that Stanford study that just is getting trashed by everybody who doesn't like the fact that it uh, says that it's not doomsday, but they've tested all those people in Santa Clara, right? And they were all asymptomatic, but they were positive. If they'd kept the metadata, that would be what you'd want. Yes, we want samples from people who have become infected, um, but who'd have effectively no worse than a common cold in symptoms. So a coronavirus, a nice infective coronavirus that produces a lot of viral particles uh, will cause symptoms somewhere around uh, you know, the common cold. And I think we could all live with just another common cold virus floating around. We've already got hundreds of them already and one more is not gonna make much of a difference to all of us. Um, so once you've managed to collect a whole bunch of samples, uh, you then have to go through and DNA sequence the genome the genome of a coronavirus is quite small. It's about 30,000 bases. Uh, modern instruments are unbelievably productive. Uh, if you had uh, 100,000 samples to sequence, that's about 10% of the capacity of a single run on a modern instrument that you can get in 48 hours. It's the limiting factor on this is not determining the, uh, the genome of the viruses. Uh, at all. So you can actually screen through hundreds of thousands of samples looking for a rare needle in a haystack using this DNA sequencing or genomics approach. So what are you looking for in this data? You're looking for deletions. So you're looking for regions that are missing from your strain that are found in the wild type strain. And you can see there on the example there, this is actually an amino acid. This is an alignment of a whole bunch of different strains of uh, coronaviruses and some of the strains have deletions or insertions and they show up really easily in the data. It's not very hard to find these. The reason why you want to aim for a deletion is it's very hard for a virus to back mutate because it's lost information. If it's just a point mutation where it's chained from say an A to a T, uh, that can easily mutate back from a T back to an A. Uh, so, but a deletion mutation is missing the region altogether and it's much more difficult for the virus to um, revert back to the dangerous strain. And if we look at polio as an example, the strain that we all worry about only has two point mutations and it tends to revert back at a reasonable frequency, uh, where the strains that have 57 mutations, and I think the other one's got 30 something, uh, they never revert back. And so there's never a problem with those strains. So that's why you would look for a deletion mutation. Great thing about this is from a bioinformatics point of view, these types of mutations stick out like a sore thumb. Okay, so once you've got a mutation that's come from a mild case and it has the right sort of deletion mutation in the region that you expect it to be, then you go out and you develop a test for this. It's very basically simple to do because it's a region missing. It's very easy to make a RT-PCR test, it's just a matter of changing the primers that are used in that test and that'll allow you to quickly go out and look for more, stra uh, more versions of that particular strand, which takes us to step five, which is we go and start looking in the community for this. Okay, so the first four steps 
are uh, quite easy and cheap to do. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars rather than you know tens of millions of dollars. Uh, but when we get to step five, it gets a little bit more complicated. We've advanced a long way. We've got a nice, hopefully more than one uh, strain that appears to have all the right properties to be attenuated and to be a good vaccine strain. But we have to go and find more cases of this. So basically you go into the community where the index case, the first sample you found with it is, and you look for more cases. You basically go door to door and you collect as many swab samples uh, from as many people in the local area as possible. So you start with basically, you go straight to their house, you check all their family members, then you go to their street and check all the people on their street. You check all the people that they've been in contact with over the last few weeks. Uh, then you go through their neighborhood and then you just keep expanding that until you've collected enough samples uh, to identify uh, whether this strain has in, uh, infected. So the idea here is just to collect more examples of people infected with this strain. Because once you've found these people, uh, you need to monitor for the clinical outcome. And what you're really looking for here is that all the cases are mild and no one ends up in hospital that's infected with that. And you use a proxy for worse than the flu symptoms as a end up is a, whether it's going to be, you can quickly rule out whether this is not a mild strain or not. So if you have uh, something like worse than the flu symptoms, but between five and 10% of cases end up in that category. So you take someone like, uh, so not necessarily being people ending up in hospital is might be difficult if you've only got limited numbers, but you can use the symptoms to give you a pretty good idea of how uh, likely uh, this strain is to be attenuated. Of course, while this is going on, while you're monitoring the, the uh, uh, patients, you want to scale up production. So you want to have everything ready to go. Uh, this sort of uh, growing a virus in cell culture is old technology. It's been around since actually before the 1950s and 1940s. It's complex. It's not an easy thing to do technically, but it's a known process. And it's basically an engineering problem, not a science problem. Uh, it's often very cheap. Uh, the polio vaccine costs 25 cents a dose, uh, basically because the technology is pretty low tech. Uh, very few modern vaccines that cheap to produce. If you take something like Gardasil, which is the hepatitis, uh, not hepatitis, uh, HPV vaccine for uh, papilloma, uh, that's on the orders of hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars a dose. And you would do this in parallel. Uh, if money is not a limiting factor uh, and time is, you would want to have all the scale up process ready to go. And that's of course what Bill Gates is proposing to do as well. He's proposing to have seven production level factories ready to go as soon as they have a, a potential candidate vaccine. And the final step is, this is a Ultimately, it's a political decision made by the regulatory agencies of whether to approve the use of this as a vaccine. They may demand that you do further large scale phase three testing, uh, but it's kind of a little bit of a, uh, a waste of time because as you can imagine, if this strain can spread uh, and you do a phase three trial, then <laughs> that's it. It's a one off uh, done. It's a bit kind of like a, the uh, viral control mechanisms that are used to control pests. So we had, had here in Australia, we had Khaleesi virus, which was a virus that was, kills rabbits. Uh, we have a big problem with rabbit pests here in Australia. I don't know whether anyone knows this or not. Uh, and they did a test run. They did a test run of this virus uh, on an island. It escaped from an island and it just basically wiped out all the rabbits in Australia, or 98% of them or something like this. If, over time, they build up resistance to it, so they've, they've kind of come back. But at the time, it was very effective. So effectively, once it goes into the field, um, then it's gone. Remember, this is already in the field as it is. It's not something that was being created in a lab. This is something that's out there being spread. Uh, the decision to use such a strain as a vaccine is something that I would imagine would be made independently by each country. Uh, 
based on the situation each country makes, but all it will take is one country in the world to make the decision to use it and it will happen. Um, and you can imagine what happens, let's say Western Samoa decides to use it, um, then the rest of the world will get this strain at that point. So brings us to the risks and rewards. The risks, well, it's a radical approach. It's something that's never been done before, uh, mainly because it's never been possible to do before. Uh, but it still is a radical approach and radical approaches um, come with risks. Uh, it may fail. And in fact, I would tend to say, if I was going to predict right now, it's probably likely to fail. Uh, it's a, not an easy process to go out and look for a lot of strains. Uh, we just may not be the right strain may not have yet appeared in the world. Uh, and so we just may have failed, not fail to find the strain. Particularly, it may not be 100% safe. Of course, we're relying on epidemiology to determine safety. And we don't know that there's one in 100,000 people with a particular illness uh, or a particular set of uh, genetic uh, background that makes, them, uh, makes this particular strain dangerous to them. And that's the same, of course, obviously, with all vaccines. Uh, and that hurdle becomes a huge thing to jump over. The really big risk is that such a vaccine will spread. From my perspective, this is a feature, not a bug, but I can imagine many people will be concerned uh, that this is something that we can't allow this to occur. But if you, people start to think about it for a bit, what is the alternative, then they might see this as being a positive. What are the rewards? Well, it's obviously going to be much faster because we've already bypassed all the other testing phases. We go straight to phase three. Uh, we get herd immunity and continued support of herd immunity. It'll work everywhere in the world. Uh, so places you can't get to and give a vaccine right now because they're in the middle of a civil war, all this conflict going on. For example, let's go Afghanistan. Um, I don't know whether many people here would be wanting to volunteer to go out and give a vaccine in Afghanistan at the moment, but these sorts of places are places where we, where polio, for example, is currently running wild, uh, places that you just cannot get in and vaccinate. And ultimately, if it works, it turns, what is it, a deadly disease into just another one of the, you know, 300, 400 different common cold viruses that are out there floating around. So, uh, which to me is a, a positive outcome. What next? Well, it's a, it's a good idea, I think. Um, but for it to go forward, it needs political and social support. Uh, so it's not going to happen if just me on my own uh, sitting here in Australia. Uh, it needs greater support around the world. Uh, and that's with radical ideas, it's not necessarily easy to achieve. But, you know, every radical idea that's become conventional was once uh, has overcome that hurdle. The ideal way to get this going is start a small scale test program. You know, we don't have to sequence hundreds of thousands of strains right from the beginning. We can start small, start from a thousand, scale up uh, and just keep going. There's no, uh, there's not a, a massive hurdle. You have to do a hundred thousand samples at once. You can actually start with any number. You can start from one. It has a, an interesting feature to it, this concept, which is it's actually possible to do all this work from the grassroots. Um, there's no particular reason that this couldn't be done outside of the conventional uh, vaccine infrastructure and regulatory infrastructure. And in fact, if you think about it, once such a strain is identified, it's going to be very difficult to stop people spreading this strain around on its own. Provided there's a test for it, people will say, let's say that you found out your best friend was infected with this strain. You might go over and visit them. Uh, purely to be able to be infected with strain so that you don't get infected with the dangerous strain. And so that's an interesting sort of uh, side aspect to this, which is, uh, which I think will influence the uh, regulatory response to the concept is that once such a strain is found, it's going to be very hard to basically put it back in its box and say, okay, we're going to not use it because it'll get used by people on their own. Remember it's out there in the community already. Um, and uh, people will find it and they'll spread it around. So doesn't, and that of course, mean, doesn't that mean you don't even really need to develop a vaccine? You can just tell people this secret, find people yep. who, are, who are testing positive, 
but asymptomatic for three weeks and then, you know, invite them into your home. Yes. Yes, you could. Uh, I, personally, I don't think that's a great way to go because there's greater risk for doing that because if you get it wrong and the person actually is not a, uh, infected with the attenuated mild strain, they're infected with a dangerous strain, then you put yourself at risk. It would be much better for this to be done with a stable, um, no, a known dose. Uh, uh, but I do think this will influence the regulatory approach to this because regulators will look and say, okay, we have two choices here. We can either approve this and try and maintain some sort of quality control over it, or we can allow it to just run wild on its own where there's much more greater risk to the population. So that does put pressure on the regulators to come to some sort of decision about whether to approve it or not approve it and tips it in the balance of approving it because they'll maintain some sort of control over it. Um, also, if you, uh, if you find, like, let's say a friend, right, uh, who has, uh, who's testing positive, but like quite a asymptomatic, you'd have to find them at the right, at the sweet spot when you could still get it from them, uh, you know, before they, before they're not contagious anymore, right? Like, not so really, because uh, you can actually take a swab sample. And if you keep it in the fridge, it'll actually stay stable for a period of time. Uh, if you want to be really careful, you put it in, um, a simple buffer uh, and then you can actually freeze it uh, and you can keep it for long periods of time but just in the fridge will last weeks. Uh, this virus is extremely contagious you don't need very much so if you had a swab on a stick you could stick it up your nose and you would be very quickly infected with such a strain so uh, it would spread very rapidly. People would start posting it around to their friends it would just spread it would be impossible if this is just my opinion it would be impossible to control the use of such a strain because people would just make use of themselves. Certainly I would be, personally, I'd be quite keen to try, particularly if I knew that this strain only gave mild symptoms and I knew it was coming from somebody who tested for it and they knew that it was the safe version. Um, I would be, I'd kind of take it myself. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, that's a, and I think many people would fall into that same category. I'm, you know, I'm lucky at the moment. I'm in Australia where we've, Uh, because it's been summer and we've maintained a pretty uh, reasonable uh, monitoring campaign. It hasn't really got out of control here yet. So, uh, but you know, I, I'm, we're about to go into winter, uh, Southern hemisphere, and I fear what's going to happen over winter. Uh, if we get a big outbreak, we're going to be like the Northern hemisphere over winter. Uh, it could be certainly, you know, I'm almost 50 uh, and You know, I'm not, this is a disease that I don't want to catch. Um, even if I survive, which the likelihood is, you know, uh, the symptoms of this disease are not particularly pleasant for a lot of people. And you just don't know whether you're going to be one of those people who is really badly hit by the disease. So. Well, you know that if you don't have underlying metabol metabolic illness, you're almost certainly not going to be terribly affected by it. Yeah, but you can still be quite ill. Um, so you can, whilst you'll survive, you can be, you know, it can be pretty unpleasant. I've read quite a lot of people who are younger than me and healthier than me, uh, not that I've got any uh, underlying problems, but um, who've had a pretty bad experience from this, you know, where you're at pneumonia level, you know, needing oxygen. That's certainly not something I'm looking forward to having if I could avoid it, so. Cool, hey, one more question. Do you think that um, to some extent this might just happen on its own? especially if people who have symptoms are isolated and people who don't kind of get unlocked and go free. Yes, just, just the, the, there's a general trend with most viruses to become less pathogenic over time. The problem is it can take a long time, it could take years and years. So whilst we might expect that, you know, SARS-CoV-2 becomes, just becomes another common cold virus over time, it might take 10 years, it might take 20 years. Um, I'm keen to kind of accelerate the process of getting to where it's going anyway. So the whole of this process does is just basically speed up the natural evolution of the, of the virus. Uh, uh, and, and it'll save a lot of people, and it'll, you know, save a lot of money to get there faster rather than just waiting for nature to run its course. I mean, it sounds almost like an improved version of, we had Robin Hansen here uh, maybe two weeks ago, 
on uh, considering deliberate exposure, especially for young folks, basically, yep. you know, proposing something, I don't know if you, if you saw his post on overcoming yes. bias, but like basically something like, you know, a, a hotel where people could go deliberately expose themselves to low doses, uh, kind of like sit it out and uh, develop antibodies, go out and uh, work again. So it seems yep. similar, but, uh, a, you know, a, to, to catch it, something that is already uh, like asymptomatic. Yeah. Yep, exactly. It's the same. Basically, they're completely compatible. All it is is instead of using one of the deadly strains to do this, yeah. Uh, yeah. to do this exposure, you use a safe strain to do the exposure, which to me seems better from all perspectives to do so. So, um, you know, it, the, that concept of you know spread that's effectively the same idea. It's just you're starting from something that's a lot safer to begin with. So um, that's why I would suggest that even if you didn't want to use this as a vaccine just to use this as a means of actually testing vaccines or improving herd immunity or whatever you're attempting to do with a dangerous strain, you can do the same thing with a safe strain. Uh, the only problem is you have to go out and look for this safe strain first uh, before you can actually have access to it. Otherwise, it's kind of become, it's just a matter of looking though. Yeah, how, how well does it correlate if you are asymptomatic to the safety of the strain? like? Because at the moment, it doesn't, it doesn't correlate at all. In fact, this is actually one of the biggest uh, things that people sort of misunderstand about this concept, which is 99.99% of people who have a mild case of the disease just happen to have an immune system that controls the virus well. Uh, and they're they happen to have a dangerous version of the virus. So they, they're not getting exposed to a mild version. Uh, they could, but it's extremely unlikely. Almost all of them are exposed to the dangerous version. Uh, but to actually, this is kind of tipping the whole process on head, saying, okay, if we want to try and find a mild version of the virus, where are we going to find it? We're going to find it in people who have mild cases. Uh, and then we've got to go and look to find if there's more of those people. So you can't just say, oh, well, you've got a mild case. You're, and you go and, go and visit your grandmother who's, 85 uh, to give it to her, then you're likely to kill her or put her in hospital. So uh, this is, we need really a mild case that people who are vulnerable or old can actually handle without getting too ill. All right. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. Uh, I had David Grossoff uh, was collecting questions from quite early on. If you, uh, if you want to have a go uh, at uh, yeah, no, you know, maybe sure. your favorite. Okay, well, <clears throat> um, I guess I wanted to know a little bit more about what's needed to carry out the evaluation of the phase three natural trial. Um, I've recently gotten, with my very limited knowledge base, a bit concerned about the difficulty of having antibody tests that are sufficiently specific for this kind of sifting use, and also um, serology that can identify neutralizing antibodies for SARS-CoV-2 rather than something else. And so if I understand things correctly from the, from the hypothesis and the related biology, you won't be able to find the RNA virus of SARS-CoV-2 in people who have experienced and benefit from cross immunization for the mild strain. Exactly. Okay, so, um, so if you don't, don't have that measure, what do you exactly look for and how stringent do the test requirements have to be to really nail okay. down this cross immunity? So you need, to, you need to find people who have a current illness, so you need to be able to isolate virus because you're looking for a particular RNA. You will not see in the serology, if someone was infected with a mild strain, uh, there will be no difference in the serology between those people who infected with a mild versus a pathogenic strain you can't tell from the antibodies because the antibody response will be to the structural proteins, which will be identical between both strains. However, you can monitor the people over time. So if you find a new case that's infected, you just watch that person over the next 30 days. You watch the, how their uh, illness progresses, and then you watch their immune response as well. And you can then see whether they produce cross neutralizing antibodies. Uh, to the wild type and that you can do uh, and because you're doing it with only a limited number of people you don't require the ability to a rapid test this can be a slow test 
uh, and there are various ways of actually proving that there's cross-neutralizing antibodies. We know from SARS-CoV-1, what is a cross-neutralizing antibody? Plus, you can also do animal studies if you want to, if you want to show that type of uh, thing on this particular strain as well. Um, but it'll be pretty obvious from the serology that you're getting the right type of antibody response from this particular strain. And if it doesn't produce an antibody response, that's not an ideal strain. You go and look for another one that actually does. So it's part of the selection process is it has to have a right type of mutation and it still has to produce a, a cross-reactive immune response protective. It's nothing very unusual. It's exactly the same thing happens with normal attenuated viruses. They go through exactly this process. Um, the only advantage is that we're starting from human th phase three trial information rather than having to start right back at the very beginning with an animal study. You could do the same thing in the lab, create a, an attenuated strain in the lab conventionally just by process, but you'd have to do it animal study, then you'd have to do a phase one human, then you'd have to do a phase two human, then you'd have to do a phase three, and that's going to take years, probably five, ten years, if you can ever get it through at all. So this one here, we just bypass all of that and go straight to the end because it's all been done by nature for us. So nature doesn't have to deal with regulatory authorities. It just does what it wants to do. Uh, but we can observe that information, and that information is very valuable. That epidemiological data on how this strain behaves in people uh, who have acquired it naturally is very, very useful information on safety, uh, Im immunogenicity, uh, stability of the virus, all these things that we want to know about a vaccine strain, we can gain by just studying people who naturally acquire this strain. I, I'll ask a second question, if that's OK. And it has to do with this challenge strain idea, which is very interesting to me. And I'm wondering whether that alone, as a tool for sifting for antibody dependent enhancement, is of sufficient utility to justify this, the expeditionary um, collection of swabs and, and data sifting. Um, and in that regard, has this challenge idea ever happened, ever worked in like, say, an animal vaccination? So the challenge, like Robert Hansen's idea, which is, he called uh, virulation. So it's what used to be used for smallpox, uh, although it's a little bit complicated because what would happen is we don't actually know from the historical data uh, whether the strains that we use for virulation were mild strains that were floating around. Certainly the people who were doing virulation uh, were selecting cases from people who had a mild case of smallpox. So they would go and collect smallpox material from people who had a mild case. That was part of their selection process. If you go back and look at the primary literature, I got into this because Robert Hansen was arguing, what's the evidence that they use mild uh, strains? Um, and it's assumed all through the liter scientific literature that they use mild cases. But if you actually go back and look at the primary literature they did, they selected people who had small, mild cases of smallpox to provide the smallpox material. Then they gave a low dose. Uh, by giving a low dose, um, you give the immune system time to catch up to the growth of the virus. So that certainly with SARS, uh, COVID-2, it appears to be if you get a high dose of the virus, uh, that you're more likely to suffer a bad outcome than if you get a small dose of the virus. It's one of the reasons why, you know, medical personnel without protection, they're exposed to high doses of the virus and they're more likely to die than you know, people in that sort of same age group. So there's some evidence to support that. So, but that's having a, a, a strain that causes mild illness is totally compatible with the idea of low dose. Um, in fact, actually using a low dose is very advantageous because uh, if you only need to use a small amount of virus to dose, to give it protection, and you don't have to make very much of it. So uh, the, 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 if you need to make, you know, 10 million viral particles uh, to produce a vaccine, but you only need to, uh, for, for say a conventional vaccine, but for this sort of low dose, you only need a thousand, then obviously you can make a lot more doses of the vaccine from the same given material, starting material. So it just makes the whole, whole process much quicker and easier. So. Uh, they're not incompatible, they're just, and it's also the idea if you want to do a challenge uh, with a conventional vaccine, let's say you've got a standard vaccine, you want to test to see whether that standard vaccine is going to protect or cause antibody dependent enhancement or any of these things that you're interested in with a conventional vaccine. You want to do that with a strain that's less dangerous. Uh, 
if you've got a choice. So just for any, vac if any vaccine approach, we should be going out there looking for one of these strains if they're there because they'll be extremely useful. Even if you don't want to use it as a vaccine directly, the live attenuated, just being able to use it to support and accelerate the conventional vaccine approaches is worth the effort of looking for it. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we had David Shaw as well with one, and then uh, maybe you can close it out with a question. Uh, but David, you had one in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Alison. Uh, thanks, Daniel. It's very interesting. Um, you keep saying it, you know, it comes to us naturally. What if you go to it? So I'm thinking that there's probably an increasing probability that uh, the numbers of people that have been exposed to mild cases is probably significantly higher than anything that's being put forth right now. And so, and then you've got real likelihood of underreporting in dense urban areas like Mexico City or Mumbai. Uh, it seemed like it would be ripe to go find or increase the probability of finding those mild yep. strains in those populations to very quickly de-risk. So the question is really, how did you model one of the risks you have is, is getting that number, what if there's a lot more people out there than you think there are that uh, possibly have that mild strain already? Oh, that's great. If, if there's 100,000 people who've got the mild strain, that's fantastic. That's going to make the regulatory agency, and you track all of those, and they've all only got a mild case and none of them end up in hospital, that's better than any, any vaccine that we're likely to get is ever going to have data-wise. Uh, so the wider that a particular strain is spread, the better. Where we'd be kind of disappointing is if we find a strain that's maybe infected 20 people or 50 <laughs> people um, and it's only just got along. And that one would go, yeah, we think it's safe. It's got the right mutations. Hasn't That just could be luck. Could actually be a dangerous strain. But if we got a strain that's infected 100,000 people, then that's perfect. Uh, but we don't know. Effectively, you can think about this sort of, the more you look, the more likely you are to find the right particular strain. It's like buying tickets in a lottery. You know, the more people we look at, the more samples we get, uh, the more, um, you know, more chances you have of winning a, a lottery. And if you could sample, you know, in an ideal world, you'd test every single person on the planet um, and check every single uh, person. And that would be buying every single ticket in the lottery. Um, but the smaller the number of people you look at, uh, the more likely you are to, you know, not win the lottery and find the strain if it's out there or strains. Uh, the likelihood is that it's likely to be probably multiple of them. And it'll be a matter of choosing which is the best out of them. All right. One question for you is, um, well, I take it from, and I'll just ask the first pre, this is the pre question. Do you have a company or anything like that that's, explicitly working on this or is this just an idea that you're trying to popularize right now well it's at this stage it's just an idea i actually do i have a i actually run a genomics company um so right, uh, I read which about i've been doing for a long time so that's why my background is in this area um, right. i used to be an academic as well working in virology i used to work on uh, bacteria viruses and i actually used a very similar approach in my laboratory we actually went out into the environment we said we want to find viruses that have these particular properties and we designed experiments that would enrich for those and then we went out and looked for them and we found them. Uh, when you, with viruses, there's so much diversity out there, whatever you're looking for, if you look uh, wide enough, you'll find it. So I guess they're the two underlying things that drove the, the concept of this forward. So, um, Okay, so now I'd, that, I'd like to raise something with you. It's kind of just a contrarian point and it's but I also want your feedback on it because you know you maybe been in this world a little more than I have so uh, we've seen a number of presentations on vaccine development strategies in this seminar series and of course you know every single biotech company is pivoting towards vaccine development basically and and here's the thing okay the, the, yours, there's another thing you've said about your strategy. There's a thing that goes unsaid about your strategy, which also separates it from most others, which is that there's no possibility that you could ever make any money on this. And here's what I mean by that, that it's doubtful that anybody's going to, 
it may not be that anybody makes money on a successful corona a successful uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine because of the pressures to you know produce it cheaply and inoculate the whole world. Um, but aside from that, because obviously some people could probably do some regulatory capture and make money on it, even even if it didn't work, frankly. But um, the other thing is that everybody that we've seen uh, here and in a few other uh, forums who's pitching a vaccine development is pitching a platform for developing all sorts of different vaccines that they have to be, they happen to be pivoting and targeting it towards SARS-CoV-2 now. And so what they're really selling is their platform and they just kind of want the, the money to help save the world right now from this one particular problem, but that'll prove their platform and then they could go on and make billions by curing all these other viral diseases. You, on the other hand, have this particular strategy to help solve this particular disease. So no one's going to be interested because they can't make any money on it. So what do you say to that? Um, well, there's two, uh, two things to say that I wouldn't want to make any money out of this anyway. Uh, um, I think it's a bit like Salk did, which was, you know, patenting the, the vaccine for polio would be like patenting the sun. It was basically completely immoral. Um, and I'm of that belief as well. So this is certainly not something that I'm intending to make any money out of. Uh, well, I have you, can been patent, thinking, you can patent it and put it in the public domain, which prevents anyone else. You could. Yeah. Uh, you, you, just putting it in the public domain already prevents anyone else from patenting it as well. So you don't have to. Um, the, the limiting factors of this is not, it's not really an expensive um, process. It's actually really the issues are more political and social, they're the limiting factors rather than the money. I actually, my company can afford to actually run this program uh, to begin with. And I certainly will be, that's my next stage to go forward with. Um, I have actually got a difficult problem, which is I'm in Australia and we cannot leave, completely shut down. Um, but that's uh, a separate issue. So uh, it's actually the worst place to try and run a program like this is Australia. We have so few cases at the moment. Um, We've got, I think, under 20 or something like that. So there's just very few people to possibly recruit. Uh, but, yeah, I do, it doesn't matter. Like, this is one of these things. I don't care um, to make any money out of it. Um, I'm quite okay financially as it is. It wouldn't make any difference to me anyway. So, But I do think um, that we do need to try all possible options and try and get it to... Um, you know, as quickly as possible to try and resolve this. As a lot of people will die, a lot of people will die indirectly. The economic cost of this is going to kill probably more people than SARS will kill directly, particularly in poor countries. Um, you know, there's going to be huge economic fallout from this and political fallout and social fallout of the, you know, incredible economic slump that we're about to enter. So I think uh, we really do need... Um, to try everything, do everything, and making money from this is something that's, you know. Right, so I would be somewhat cynical and contrarian there. So the sort of flip side of that is then, you know, what can, what can we do to help who might, we might have various connections and, you know, anyway, what, what do you want? Yeah, well, that's, that's the next thing. Basically, at least to get a, a sort of a groundswell of political support or social support this to go forward. That's why I've been trying to get out there and promote it. Uh, you know, there are scientists who are trying to promote it from a scientific point of view. But this is one of these things where the actual technology requirements to get this up and running is pretty small. You just need basically a website, somebody to post out a kit, to send that to a laboratory, standard straight off the shelf. They then do the testing and you collect the data and off you go. And then once you've got a index case, um, you've got a strain that you think is attenuated, then you go and look for more of it. Um, uh, you're in a much stronger position to say, look, we've found this strain, looks to be attenuated. Can we go and find more and try and get local support at that area? We don't know where that could be. Could be in Mexico, could be in Brazil, could be in the US, could be in France, could be anywhere in the world. We just have no idea at this stage. India, there's many, many places in the world this strain could pop up and off it goes. So, But the idea is, Unless we actually start doing something, it'll just remain an idea. So um, my sort of intention is to try and get it going. Uh, 
use the resources of my company basically to get it going and then see if people want to join in and try and make it into reality. So uh, very practically, you need someone right now who could bring up such a website. Uh, then yeah, well, actually, uh, uh, that's actually something I can actually do myself. That, the difficulty yeah. I face at the moment is I'm in Australia. Yeah. It's actually getting, I need to get, um, there's two practical things, which is you need to do it somewhere where you can actually get ethics approval to do such a thing. It should be pretty straightforward to do. Uh, but if, for example, I've tried to see if I can piggyback off the existing samples, particularly out of places like Germany, where they're testing a lot of asymptomatic people there or places where they're picking up. And, you know, they can't, you would think, okay, well, don't, I don't want to sample. I just want you to do add on, do a genomic sequence on top of it once you get a sample. And they can't even do that. It's, you know, hey, um, the ethics uh, and this is it's too deep something I want to bring up just just because I'm not sure if we're in contact with each other outside this forum. Um, do you know, are you aware of that recent semi-controversial Stanford Santa Clara uh, t testing? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. I know that guy. That guy, Ian yep. Otis, the guy who ran that study, the controversial yep. Stanford epidemiologist who's, who's um, everybody's hating on because he's trying to say this isn't the end of the world, right? I know him. And he, he did that study. So if that's of any use, I'd be happy to make an introduction. Exactly. Well, it's, if you can find somebody who's got the political clout to get this sort of thing moving forward, fantastic. Um, he would already, he'd be ideal because he already has the ethics approval to do this. And he's got so the, in place. a big data set so, of tens of thousands of people that they tested who were asymptomatic and positive. Yep. Exactly. Except they did serology, unfortunately. So the problem is you can't take somebody who was infected, say, in February uh, because they no longer have the virus in them. You need to have people who are currently infected, oh. uh, unfortunately. So that's, but they can just wheel on the process. It's very simple because you don't need, uh, you can just, people are quite capable of uh, doing the samples because you're actually trying to find a mutant strain, it doesn't matter whether you miss a certain percentage of people because the person didn't stick the swab up their nose correctly. It doesn't, that's just another thing that you throw out in the, uh, the thing. You just mean, as long as you get a 90%, then that's fine. So all of these things, you just means you just, you know, screen more people to look for it. So uh, right. you don't need to, but ideally what you want to do is you want to do it as wide across geographically as possible and not just do a lot of tests in one local area because it's, uh, you're looking, you want to try and test across the whole United States, the whole of North America, whole South America, whole of, whole of the world, ideally. Uh, the broader you can go, the better. But you start anywhere and you just expand. It's just uh, as you're going along. But yeah, if he's, if he's interested in this, there's a scientific paper, which of the group I mentioned in Italy and Spain, which has written it up, basically this, so which I can send to people if they want to read this, which basically just explains the whole concept in a, uh, you know, scientific way, which is often if you're talking to other scientists, they prefer that rather than some blog from some crazy guy from Australia, uh, which is what the current, uh, written in layman's language, which is what the current... Uh, sure, can you get that to Alison so she can get it to the group? Yes, yes, uh, that's not a problem, so... All right. Uh, is there any way, should I, you know, because we'll be publishing and then um, publishing and then disseminating the salon. So is there a way uh, for people to contact you or should they go through me? Then I can uh, give my email address. Which yeah, is I've email. actually got my email address is actually on the website. Um, you actually found me via New Clack, So I'm actually not a very difficult person to find. Mm -hmm. I have a, a fairly unique name. So I'm not John Smith or something like that, the equivalent or uh, so I'm actually relatively easy to track down, but actually on the post at the bottom of that, there's actually my, uh, Gmail address and people can actually contact me directly that way. Um, yeah. so, um, okay, I'm saying yeah, this the, just in case, in case someone cannot contact him, uh, which has worked in the previous salons, it's just, I give my email address, which is a at foresight.org, uh, write me and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll forward you, uh, I'll, for, I'll forward you email. Okay, so if you had like, you know, maybe if we could finish off with like, you know, we've been tiptoeing around it, but like, you know, the as specific as you can make the ask, maybe the better. 
So, you know, if people are just like, okay, what exactly are you looking for? You know, so they like, you know, stage, you have collaborators. Very simple collaborators. Okay. People that can actually help turn this into reality. Um, uh, I'm geographically in the worst place in the world. Maybe Antarctica might be worse, um, but pretty much Australia is the worst place in the world to turn this into reality because uh, we just don't have any cases. I can't leave the place. Um, we're in lockdown. Uh, it makes it very difficult. But collaborators, anyone who's got any interest, um, and this is one of these things where if the idea gets out there, uh, more and more people, and then eventually it'll hit the right person to say, yep, we should be doing this. Why aren't we doing this? Let's make it happen. Um, and let's let it get, go for it. They can steal the concept, claim the credit for it, do whatever they like, um, just get it done. That's what I want to see happen. So uh, from my perspective, yeah. All right. Hey, I cannot thank you enough for joining on such short notice. Uh, it sounds like a totally fantastic idea. I think I'm very happy how, you know, you know, you go from like first deliberate exposure or like violation to like those like much more refined and, and just better and like le like lower risk with higher reward uh, kind of like iterations of, um, you know, of ways that, you know, even uh, like citizen scientists could get, could get involved here. So it's, it's really fantastic. Uh, I, I applaud you for, for joining so on, on such short notice and uh, would certainly try everything possible to, uh, to get you the collaborators. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Alison, for inviting me. That's always interesting. I had to write up this as a talk because I'd only had it as a blog post. Um, and, but it's, yeah, it's just great to get an opportunity to try and get this idea out there. And I've, my opinion is that if we keep trying, eventually you'll hit the right person, uh, you'll get the right support, um, enough will happen and it'll coalesce and something will happen. And that's how everything that's ever happened in history has happened. It starts off small and if it's a good idea or a good concept and it spreads uh, and eventually you know something major uh, goes forward so uh, there's no point just saying oh well someone else will do it because uh, you know someone else might do it so it's you know making sure that it actually gets done all right hey thank you so so much i will notify right. you when the video is up and i hope you have a lovely day thanks everyone for joining and um yeah please share the video once it's up i'll notify you okay all. Okay. Thank All right. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.